okay guys good morning welcome back to day number two of these five days training uh, again remember this is uh, Aruba certified or at least the training that will prepare you for the Aruba certified switching uh, um, associate ACSA and uh, for the exam HPE 6 I believe A73 um, we did talk about that exam so today we will cover probably most likely two modules I say most likely we might cover more it depends how we get on number one we will cover VLANs and number two we'll cover Spanish tree I would like to spend a bit of time on Spanish tree as well as well as on uh, the VLANs um, at the same time now um, what other objectives uh, here is or are learning objectives compare and describe collision and broadcast domains so this takes us to the basics of communication within the network, within the Ethernet. Because the Ethernet as, um, as a technology is a broadcast technology, meaning they will always be broadcast due to the fact we have things like ARP. So they will always need to send an ARP request at some stage. And because the tables are not really, for example, permanent tables when they build the intelligence, the control planes, MAC tables, ARP tables, they get refreshed entries, I mean, not the whole table. Entries, they get refreshed every five minutes, 300 seconds. And that's why you find these um, entries will always, they will be um, broadcast at some stage. Even the machine itself, will, they will have entries, like the computers or laptops or whatever, also get refreshed every five minutes. So that will also uh, need to be updated, describe and configure VLANs. <coughs> Explain 802.1Q tagging and what does it um, uh, mean to us? Some vendors, they co it's a tagging, but the command, you will find them, they call it encapsulation. Technically, it should be tagging, yeah? So, the trunk port and the tagging and untagged VLAN or the native VLAN. So, we're going to explain these terms. Trunk ports, what does it mean? And access ports at the same time, that will take us to the also to a discussion of access port, MAC address and ARP forwarding tables, and then describe very important um, module, uh, especially for those, all of us, we have gaps in our knowledge. So it's good to look at that one in a different or fresh, uh, a more uh, refreshing, if you like, for some of us, and maybe something new for uh, some of us as well. Uh, look at the frame delivery process. Now you can't find <coughs> a frame remember but it's a layer two. So the OSI model layer two uh, in the frame and uh, basically in the TCP IP model layer one. Yeah. So domains, collision domain, broadcast domain. Now uh, we need to know what are these and how switching helped reduce and manage these domains. Okay. Virtual LAN, VLAN is, is, a, is a virtual LAN. Um, what are benefits, security, uh, management for traffic and so on. Dot 1Q is the standard. This standard, um, early 2000, became mature, if you like. Um, before that, different vendors, they have different things to mark the, um, or to identify the frame crossing the switches. They had a little bit different ways to do it. Mainly, it used to be encapsulation, and that's why in Cisco they used to be they used to be called ISL, interswitch link or interswitch um, encapsulation, which is basically um, they used to encapsulate. But that was proprietary technologies. Um, vendors they only had to work with each other within themselves. When the standard came, it became possible for multi-vendors to communicate with each other on the uplinks. Uh, before that, it was not possible um, because the encapsulation was understood by certain devices, but not understood by other devices. So dot one q made it possible to have multi-vendor deployment as well. <coughs> and it was after dot one q became possible to do phase, um, phase upgrade. So you can upgrade part of the network still you have multi-vendor maybe a distribution different than the edges and so on and you could do dot one q so that was a kind of a revolution in that sense mac tables up operation um up table as well and uh, delivery for the for the frame and we're going to see how the mac address changes the frame itself 
remember it has headers and trailer at the frame level um, we're going to see how that really uh, changes as we move uh, the frame from one location to another location to the destination so we're going to look at that um, as well domains <coughs> the word domain english domain yeah but means different things in different contexts here we talk about the collision collision and broadcast collision when i remember imagine we me talk and you talk we collide with each other so this is collision domain and uh, because then if there's a collision domain or there's a collision then there's no way that we can hear each other now broadcast is to more to do with the efficiency and the performance of the network so as a human alice and bob they're good guys yeah good um, people nice people ears sense other talking and be polite way to your tent <laughs> that's nice yeah detect collision back off and try again this is exactly what happens in the network so basically bob i bought a house at least i'm getting married okay they talk to each other but at the very same time that's collision so when multiple communicating parties in the network contact communicate simultaneously collision happens yeah so in the ethernet world they started many many years back with what so-called hubs they were hubs only there were no switches and even the connection used to be called b and c you know the different like a tv uh, connector like and in this case if it is a hub hub doesn't care the hub doesn't know right okay but in ethernet world we have what so-called carrier sense multi-axis Multiple or multi-axis means the medium, the cables, are multiple. So multiple devices access the same medium. But what's good about it is they will detect collision, collision detection, CD, collision detection. So the neck on the machine will detect that connection, wait their turn. So uh, they will back off, they try again, they say, okay, I'm going to try in another 30 milliseconds, something like this, okay? They're going to wait and they'll try. Collision might, uh, might occur again. They will back off again. They don't tell each other, oh, I'm going to back off for 10, 10 seconds or 10, you know, and the other one's going to say, oh, I'm going to back off for 0.5 seconds. It's just numbers they select locally and they start transmitting again. And they try again. In the wireless, on the other hand, as I said to you yesterday, the, uh, the paradigm of communication is a little bit different we have multi-axis the same here but we have collision avoidance so they try to avoid collision rather than detect and back off so that's why wait your turn avoid collision so if transmission is unsuccessful they will try again they will back off now normally if there's a performance issue you can take the box of um, uh, request to send so rts okay and clear to send cts we call it rts and cts in a way we have an infrastructure device, which is in this case an access point. And I am station A, for example. And if you enable that feature here, that feature will be communicated to the communicating parties like the machines. And if the network card, i.e. wireless card, support that feature, they would say, okay, can I please, is it, can I please send uh, traffic? He say, he's going to say, or she's going to say, wait. Um, and then when it is clear, it's going to send a message clear to send. Now, that's nice. The issue with that is it is an overhead for the performance. Yeah, We only go for these measures if we find out that there are a lot of collisions and a lot of drop frames that performance is really degraded, then we go for that option. So it is possible to kind of improve that situation. Obviously, there are many multiple things in wireless world nowadays uh, to improve the communication keep in mind so far we can only one side can talk that side have has to wait because otherwise there would be collision right that is both for both ethernet and wi-fi perfect no problem so the same kind of mechanism same mentality except the approach is different in wireless and ethernet okay now that was collision domain and the performance the more you have many conversation in the same noisy room it's the more you have the more issues you add basically so what they say okay no problem 
In this case, we're going to split in multiple domains, multiple rooms. Okay. Now that will improve performance because in each room we have less people to talk, right? So if I reduce the number of people talking, this resembles like how many people talk to the same AP access point, how many people connect to the same switch or say same hub. Okay. Two noisy hosts in one collision domain. That's a collision domain. If I have, we have two hubs in this case, that would be two collision domains because each one of them is completely separate. If I have one AP, one collision domain. If I have two APs on the other hand, then I have two collision domains. It means the size of each collision domain is less than the other, uh, uh, than the original collision domain. So rather than having 100 people communicating with one AP, I might say, okay, 50 50. That's nice. That's all good and nice. And uh, as basic, pr basic principle, just to comment on the channels, in wireless world, we cannot communicate next to each other on the same channel. We must not do that. Now, that will be called co-channel interference. CCI, sometimes you can see this term, CCI, co-channel interference. Now, there's another mechanism called ch channel coloring also. We can tag a channel and to distinguish between different APs and there are ways to improve that, yeah? But again, the bottom line, the less number or the more APs, the less number of people connect to that AP, the smaller the collision domain size, the better the performance. Okay, now, that's just to understand the concept. Okay. So in broadcast domain, so that was a collision domain, yeah? A group of devices that can hear each other, we are in broadcast domain. Okay, so in here, there are two switches forward broadcast all out ports, except the ingress. And that's how they learned things. So the switch will learn, we call it learned MAC addresses. You send a traffic, so the switch will receive that traffic and say, okay, I've received this MAC from that port. And remember, one port might have multiple MACs, MAC addresses learned from it. Example, a blink port that goes to the core you might have 50, 100, 1,000 MAC addresses learned from that port. Okay. <clears throat> because there are multiple frames coming in. So you will learn or you will build your MAC table based on the ingress. And if a broadcast is sent to the switch, it will be forwarded to every single interface except the one it has received from. And again, and everything traffic is broadcast will be the same process and so on and so forth. And that's how they build the MAC table. Okay, nice stuff. So here we have sent a broadcast from the host A. It will be forwarded to every single interface except the interface was received on. Otherwise, that will be a loop, be a local loop. Now, the routing device does not forward broadcast. So our request will not be forwarded natively, remember this, by um, a layer 3 or your default gateway. And there will be another mechanism to do that, yeah? So it still will be R, but it, it will replace its MAC with the, uh, with the source MAC and so on. There will be a few things to look at later on, yeah? But we can see two broadcast domains. A broadcast domain might be physical device, a switch that has 40 ports, another switch that has 40 ports. Each one of them is a broadcast domain. Okay, fine. And then between them, if you don't have a layer, th if you have a layer 3 interface um, device, these broadcasts are completely separated from each other. Okay. Small broadcast domain can improve performance and mitigate risks. That's definitely the case. So there will be a question here for us. Which of the following options or which of the options below accurately describe collision domains and broadcast domains? There will be two options, by the, by the way. A written device describes the edge of a broadcast domain, correct? A switch defines the edge of a, of a collision domain. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so so the collision domain will never will be on that switch basically. But of course, if you the more you add, the more collision in the same uh, network. But we'll come back to this later on to see how routing help us reduce. Of course, there will be no broadcast right crossing the boundary. So a routing device, there's no way impossible for the broadcast to leave to a different VLAN, for example, or different switch, unless um, 
you know we need to get an up and we will look at that mechanism um, <clears throat> virtual land so benefit creating and mapping so here going back assume we have um, land this is physical land yeah so imagine you have physical device and have another physical device this is in land we have not said vlan we said land yeah so this represents an old style router for example land 10 land 20 nice stuff they talk to each other absolutely but none of these they don't talk to each other so one and two a b talk to each other c and d and e talk to each other <coughs> but not between them now logically we have a layer 3 device so there we go um, that is a layer 3 device a router interface has uh, interface in VLAN or in, in, in network 10 another interface in network 20 nice no problem the VLAN in this how VLAN makes things easier now we have one physical switch and that specific physical switch, which is the same one, we kind of creating inside it like a virtual switch. Hence the term V, virtual LAN, virtual switch. So we have created a virtual LAN that is represented by a VLAN. Another one is a virtual LAN represented by VLAN. <coughs> the, the effect literally of this is equal to the effect of this. Obviously without the router now. And to communicate between these guys, we need to still have the functionality. So think of this has been moved to this. We still have the layer three functionality that is needed for these two to communicate, which we will come back to this as well. So physical switch, the yellow one, and two virtual switches, which are represented by VLAN 10 and VLAN 20. Okay, so that is um, the same scenario, same way. But what we have saved, we have saved hardware, obviously. Efficiency, space, CO2 footprint, so heating, and multiple different things. And that's why VLANs were really an invention that, it, that made it possible for the network to, to expand as we see it nowadays. Okay, so here we have um, switches that have multiple interfaces. And when they invented switches, so they started with hubs a long time ago, and they moved to what's so-called bridges. And as the term indicates, they used to bridge. So bridges used to be only two interfaces, for example, and that's it. So bridge from one side to another side, and that's it, okay? So, and then switches used to be called multi-port bridges. And then the term switches, and as you see, the term switch is to switch from one interface to another interface. Um, at large, switches come with a VLAN we call default VLAN, that is VLAN 1, always the case, that VLAN 1 does exist. Now, the switch behavior depends on the model, and that's across all vendors, basically, Cisco, Juniper, uh, Aruba, HPE, and so on, yeah? Now, in this case, by default, we have all interfaces, in this case, switch with the 24 interfaces in VLAN 1. And we create a VLAN 10. Now, when you create a VLAN, it's a VLAN, nothing attached to it, okay? So it is just as useless as, as if it is, does not exist. Because now it has no function, except it is being created. What we need to do is to make it effective, obviously. You have to attach, attach interfaces to that VLAN. So that switch now, as if we're mimicking a switch with no interfaces internally. Um, again, when I have... Um, this command I create a range of VLANs 2 to 5 so it means 2 3 4 5 and then VLAN 10 so I have created five different VLANs named as you can see them or identified as you see them no VLAN 10 very simple that has deleted or negated VLAN 10 and VLAN 10 shut down it means I'm shutting down the VLAN 10 disabling that VLAN completely it means the VLAN even any port connected to it, the port will be up, that's fine, but the VLAN status will be down because we shut down the VLAN. Yeah, we kind of disable the switch, like something like this. We can give the name for that VLAN, VLAN 10, name sales, business as usual. So now we can see how we can create a VLAN, shut down the VLAN, and give a name to the VLAN. Now we need to map an interface or interfaces to VLAN. 
There are two types of interfaces in the context of CX switches. Uh, in the majority of all vendors, these are the main two types, basically. And one type called access port, as the name indicates, is meant for access, is meant for the endpoints to connect to them, and that's hence the term access, right? Define the VLAN, then VLAN 20, give it a name, for example, uh, we've done two VLANs now, 10 and 20. Now we need to assign an interface to the VLAN or interfaces. We have probably two options. We can do a range. This is like a range command, but it's much easier. Interface, one slash, one slash, one, dash, or hyphen, one slash, one slash, two, and that is two interfaces. I could have done more than that, obviously, yeah? And VLAN access 10, it means this is access in VLAN 10, and you can only have one, interf one VLAN access on any interface. So one access membership, you can't have multiple. And then the same here, 11 to 12, we have VLAN access 20. So this is VLAN access 1 and 2 in VLAN 10, 11, 12 are in VLAN 20. That's absolutely perfect. And the rest of the ports stay still uh, stay in VLAN default, which is VLAN 1. Okay. So another term, let's say, put it this way, the native VLAN for, for these interfaces, like 1 and 2, the native VLAN is VLAN 10. And when you, we use the term native VLAN, it is meant to uh, indicate it's untagged. The VLAN is untagged. It means I will not attach any information um, as a tag. There's no tag because this is untagged native VLAN and it is access. The same applies to 11 and 12. If you issue the command show VLAN, you can see the name of the VLANs because the fact we gave them names, status up, reasons okay, every fine, st type static VLAN, okay, and then interfaces, these are the interfaces. An interface, of course, VLAN 1, there we go, and the rest of the interfaces would be on the VLAN 1 basically, but they just to make it shorter and we can see it. What are the benefits of creating VLANs? Mention two benefits. So C and E are correct answers. Thank you very much. Now that's access, right? That's how we created VLANs. We give it a name. Now we move on to the next topic or with the next kind of nice stuff, dot one q And 802.1q is about standard and uh, part of that standard is the tagging and the trunk ports. So now the terms tagging, the term tagging, it means a unique identification for the frame to indicate to which VLAN it belongs to. And the trunk port is a term to indicate we can have multiple tagged. So we will tag multiple VLANs to use one link. So we're gonna look at the use case here. We have two switches, switch one, switch two, and each one of them has uh, VLAN 10 and VLAN 20, plus VLAN 1, of course. Um, now assume I would like to carry each VLAN individually. So between the switches, how many links do I need? I need one link for VLAN 1, assuming this is the way I'd like to do it. And I need to have one link for VLAN 10. I, have, I need another link for the VLAN 20. So if I have 50 VLANs, if I go that way, I need 50 links. Now, it's doable, but that would be extremely uh, non-scalable and extremely tedious, and that would be a, a big problem. So they said, okay, that's all nice, but why don't we do this? Think of this one like, why don't we have one conduit that can carry all VLANs together? But the problem with that, when I carry multiple VLANs, how can I make sure things don't mix up. They said, no problem. We will assign a kind of a stamp for each VLAN, and that stamp is called tag. A tag is a key in this case, because I will uniquely identify each frame when they leave or reaches the other switch. And they will be able to map it to the correct VLAN when they reach the other switch, either from switch one to two or vice versa. Uh, so we're gonna tag, we call tag VLAN. And a tag has created a longer frame because the standard frame size is 1500 plus 18, which is the header trailer and uh, destination Mac. And then uh, all of these are 1518. Okay. Um, 
when you add a tag the tag is four bytes so from the the, the size of that frame has increased from 1518 to 1522 because four extra bytes have been added okay the question is is that okay do switches uh, are switches able to support this the answer natively yes there's no problem you don't have to enable any special feature for that what i mean by this you don't have to enable what's so-called jumbo frame you don't have to right it's called mini jumbo if you like and that is acceptable and processed by all switches that support 802.1q okay trunk and we call this one trunk think of this one like the trunk where you carry multiple uh, probably um, electrical cables um, in, in the, as a conduit yeah so we call that trunk or conduit so the same here it is a trunk and that trunk is meant to carry multiple vlans so any frame from any vlan on that link between the switches will be uniquely identified so when they leave they kind of leave and stamp it and so when they leave think of this one like your passport you're leaving one country to another country you need to have your id so you, you are allowed to enter but from certain vlan okay so the same applies here uh, for vlan 20 and they leave what's a good native vlan remember the native vlan which is the untagged vlan notice there's no tag here vlan 10 has a red tag here there's no tag we call this one untagged frame original frame untagged and we call this one tagged frame now the switch will know shall i process a tag or not from the frame type so there will be ethernet type that will indicate this is a tagged frame and or oh, this is not tagged frame if there's a tag you say okay can i look into the tag and find out what the information and that will indicate to which vlan it belongs to when they send it out to the other switch they will map be mapped to the correct vlan in this case yeah okay um native vlan again um there are a few details that probably later on we can talk about but native vlan is meant to carry any vlan any traffic by the way so if a traffic comes from a hub say it will go to a native vlan so uh, any traffic that has no vlan membership or it has um, it is a member of the native VLAN on the switch, like VLAN 1 by default, it will always be carried on the native VLAN on the uplinks. Okay. Peers must have the same native VLAN. Okay, I need to comment on this. They must have native VLAN the same, 100% correct, for the, everything to work. Now, what happens if you have mismatched native VLAN? For example, the native VLAN on the left hand side say VLAN 100 and the native VLAN in here is VLAN 1 what will happen the network will work for VLAN 10 everything is going to work but if you expect the VLANs like in VLAN 100 and VLAN 1 they will end in each other VLAN and that's bad of course especially if there's a network service and like DHCP and so on we call this one VLAN leak so it's, if you mismatch and misconfigure the VLANs, you will get in what's so called VLAN leak. So one VLAN end up in the other VLAN domain, if you like, yeah, and that can be bad, yeah. And that's why we say we must go with the same native VLAN. There are cases when uh, you have to go with a you know native VLAN will be mismatch and should not impact your uh, traffic. But again, there's not a place to discuss it. But bottom line, native VLAN must match between the switches. And then if you need to tag at one end, you must tag as at the, at the other end. If you miss by mistake, don't tag it at one end. It will be dropped. OK. So um, here's an example interface one slash one slash 24 uplinks most likely. And we're going to say trunk VLAN trunk allowed VLAN one, which is a native 20, 10 and 20. So we have three VLANs now. And if you show VLAN port 1 slash 1 slash 24, nice command, keep that in mind. Uh, we will see what is going on. Native untagged VLAN, and these two are tagged VLAN trunk. Yeah, so these are tagged VLAN, this is native. Okay. Interface, um, I can change it, obviously. So if you leave it as default, like if I say port allowed these VLANs, 
um, and I just um, allow, I just issue this command. By default, VLAN one will be the native, that's it. Any other VLAN you are allowing on the link will be tagged. I can change that uh, by assigning a different native VLAN. As best practice, you move away from VLAN one as a native VLAN. There are certain cases where VLAN uh, one not must be allowed for, uh, for some purposes, but as best practice for security, uh, it's always advisable not to make VLAN one as a native VLAN. So you must select different VLAN as a native VLAN in this case. And it has to be persistent. So in all switches in your network, the same native VLAN should be supported in, in, in your LAN, for example. Yeah. Again, we have done the same. We issue the command show VLAN port 124. Uh, we can see VLAN 10 has changed. This VLAN 1 is still permitted and now has become tagged. Okay. What is true from the following um, lines of configuration? Interface 24. 1124, of course. VLAN um, trunk allow 1 and 20. What does this mean? Um, so D is the correct answer. We know this because that is a default behavior. So we understand the VLAN, the assistive VLAN. We understand switches. We understand uh, broadcast domain. And we understand collision domains. Right. The next one we're going to talk about is how things are forwarded simply we could have forwarding tables so we have mac table to match the port to a mac and arp table to match the ip to a mac because eventually everything will be converted to a mac of course yeah so um mac table as i said to you before they will hold the information for an entry because each entry might have different time or learned diff a different time so might some entries might refresh now, some other entries might refresh other 200 seconds. It depends when it was learned, right? Um, so the minute you send something, the switch will grab this and it will learn it. It will keep it. It will cache it in what's so-called back table. And the back table is mapping between the port, the incoming, and it says type here dynamic. Because there are other ways to add, to map the map to a port, can do it statically as well and that might not time out right but in dynamic way when you learn um, it will be 300 uh, seconds one of the things also they do which is really great they will also tell you to which vlan does that mac address belong to so this is the table the switch will look at to find out which vlan does this frame belong to in this case vlan 10 for example and 20 these are and they will tell you the ports nice and easy Forward frames based on the dynamic or destination Mac, yeah? Build the frame based on the incoming, right? So incoming, I will build, and I will look at that one to forward the, um, look at the destination to forward the frame. Times out every 300 seconds and so on. The ARP table on the other side is I know your IP, I need to complete the frame. I have every, every information, but I don't know your Mac. So I will send an ARP request the source would be the MAC address of the specific machine. So the source is always be, going to be a specific MAC. Destination would be everybody. So all ifs. It means broadcast the MAC. So can you please, I don't know who you are. If you hold that IP, respond. That's what happens. So now I'm targeting somebody with that IP. That somebody with that IP has this MAC. What happens really in this case the response comes from this, with the source MAC being the MAC of this machine, destination MAC would be the MAC of the requesting machine. Now the switch has learned the two MAC addresses, one on this interface and another one on the other interface. Likewise, the machines have learned it. So if you go to the command prompt and issue the command up minus A on machine A, you'll, feel, you'll see it has mapped the IP to the MAC. And the same applies to the machine B. When the request came to it, it grabbed it and built in the ARP table. Next time, the machine will never send an ARP request to get to that destination because it has the mapping now. So the machine is going to say, thank you very much. Now, two things. The machine has built its own ARP table. The switch has built its own ARP table. 
Now, do they have to match time-wise? Well, in this case, if nothing happened in between, there will be the same timing. Nearly, maybe millisecond difference. Yeah? But let us say I, I flushed out the MAC table here. What happened? The up table here. What happens? Then this up entry will not be equal to this up entry. Isn't it? Right? So assume that is the case. Now, is this say I reset the up table on the switch. What will happen? There we go. Now the machine, knowing the mapping, it will not send an ARP request because it already knows it. It will send, say, unicast communication because the machine thinks I know everything. It will form the frame. It will say, Mr. Switch, can you please take this, send it to that guy. The switch now says, oh, I don't know, right? So what happens really in this case, the switch will deal with that one or treat it as a multicast, uh, as a broadcast, we call it unknown unicast to, from the switch perspective. But to the machine here, it is, um, you know, it's going to be unicast. So it's going to be sending it. The difference is it will not send an ARP. It will only send a normal unicast frame, but in all interfaces. That's all. Yeah. Which options below accurately describe MAC address and ARP tables? It will be D and E because... It would be built based on the source MAC. That would have been correct if this was a MAC address here, right? Arp table maps IB to MAC. Switches use the MAC address table to properly uh, forward the frames. That's where the intelligence, how switches started having more intelligence than the hubs. Hubs had no clue about any tables. Hubs were multi-port repeaters, we used to call them. Basically, take the signal, just boost it again, that's all. You know, and doing nothing. Now, <clears throat> how switches communicate uh, layer two frame delivery here? Say, for example, um, in this case, uh, PC1 and PC, uh, server one did need to communicate. PC1 has this MAC address with this IP. It is a member of VLAN 20. The link between axis one and axis two is a trunk carrying all VLANs 1, 10, and 20, with VLAN one being the native. Server belongs to VLAN 20, so they now, both of them, are in the same VLAN, meaning they're in the same broadcast domain, and meaning they are in the same collision domain. Do we need any layer 3 device in between? The answer is no, because there is no need to cross any boundaries. There is no need to cross any VLAN. So if that was the case, and both of them in VLAN 20, then that's all good. They will be able to communicate. The fact we are allowing VLAN 20 between the switches, that will facilitate the movement of the frames without the need for any layer 3 device. So if we look at this, from the PC1, PC1 initiate that initiate the FTP session in this case, like a session to get a file or send a file. So initially, PC1 did not know the destination map because that is the server. PC1 will have its own source MAC. Destination MAC is unknown. We know all of this. How do we know this? I know my source IP. Of course I know. I know my destination IP. How would I? Because maybe the application, we just inserted the IP. Yeah? Or the application contact something that is built in. Yeah? So this is something maybe done manually or automatically. Yeah? Okay. That, this is like, I gave you a simple example. If you need to print... You can use HP Smart, for example, Smart Printing. And they will scan and they will discover the IP of the printer. That's how the IP is uh, discovered, yeah. Again, layer 4, the source port, we know, our printer 1. And FTP, then the destination port will be 21. That is a session, right? And then layer 5 to 7, we are sending a get command, get FTP, right? So get a file called file.x text from this IP address. Good stuff. And then we have the frame as is. You can clearly see what's going on. So FTP session is initiated. We did, we did say this. And we're trying to go FTP. So we might have gone to the browser. And you type this um, FTP colon slash, uh, slash the destination IP. PC knows the destination IP, but not the destination MAC. There we go. Initiate an ARP request to identify the MAC. Okay. Then coming back. Frame delivery ARP request. So the ARP now is requested being sent. So that's step number four. 
initiated by the PC. I need to find the destination Mac. I don't know. I'm going to kind of put a placeholder. Everyone will say, okay, thank you very much. Switch will receive that, and th that's an ARP header. The target Mac, the target IP, source Mac, source IP, that's ARP header. And then, again, that's a frame, but that's an ARP frame. And then, what will happen, access one switch, adds PC1 to MAC address table, because it has received that MAC request. This access one like a thief, immediately will grab anything, right? Destination is a broadcast, so every single interface will be sent to, except the one that has been received on, which is interface number three. The trunk port is no exception, so that will will also get that uh, um, in a broadcast um, on the trunk port, bring ID to the frame, and send it to our request from the um, cross the trunk to access to. What is the VLAN ID in this case would be VLAN 20 because they belong to VLAN 20. Fair enough. Okay. And then access to will receive that um, source map to the, so it will say, okay, now I can, I can report this MAC address. I could see it on my interface 28. So it will build an entry again. So now we have two switches built entries in the MAC table up uh, due to the ARP request interface three to this. And interface 28. Moving on, uh, this session is a broadcast, so access to will send it to everybody, will flood it to everywhere, and the server that has that IP will respond. And the server now will add this machine MAC address to its IP address <laughs> in its app table. So next time the server needs to respond, it will never send an ARP request because it has the entry basically, right? So will not include the VLAN ID because it's untagged, of course. So the interface will be access, yeah, um, in this case. And if that is the case, there will not be a tag information on interface four. So the tag information literally is only on interfaces 28 on both of these switches, right? So I will respond with the ARP reply as a unicast. It's always, always that the, the response or the reply to ARP is always unicast, never a broadcast. The request is a broadcast, but the response is a unicast uh, because it knows who has initiated that request. So now source address and MAC would be the server. And um, when you send it back and in the ARP, of course, the sender will be uh, that was the original sender here and then the target was there and it has inserted its MAC address now right so the response goes back access one switch will receive and will report the server MAC address from interface 28 15 access one will forward the ARP reply to the um, to interface 3 okay and why how does how did it know because the ARP response was targeted to that specific machine because that is a unicast response and notice that's a destination MAC right for that okay and then they can so the session is established then everyone all parties can communicate in this case okay when might a switch add a VLAN tag um, to a frame when does it add a tag to the frame thank you so when it forwards the frame from another switch to another switch.